Welcome to this two-part series on understanding aging and the role of the human hippocampal subfields in pattern separation. I'm Craig Stark and in this first part we're going to be talking about what is pattern separation and how might we actually be able to observe it in people. So first off, really what is pattern separation? Well, pattern separation talks about transforming similar overlapping representations of information into more dissimilar patterns of representation. So take this picture of this Alexandrine parakeet. If I were to stick some electrodes into your brain, I would find that there are some neurons that are firing right now as you're looking at this picture and others that aren't. So we could color code the firing ones, in this case blue, and the ones that aren't firing uh, white. And we can see that there's some pattern of activity, some representation for this, for this bird. If I move and I show you a different picture, for example this picture of the larch here, we'll get a different pattern of activity. And if I were to superimpose these two different patterns of activity on top of each other, you'd see that in fact there's very little overlap. There's only one green element here saying that these, uh, this unit or this neuron here was active in both of them. So we could represent different information in different ways and not have overlap. The problem, however, comes in <clears throat> what if I instead I showed you this Indian ringneck parakeet? It's very similar and so in many places it's going to have a similar representation, both in, say, visual cortical regions and also in the medial temporal lobe. So if we stick these two on top of each other, we see a whole bunch of purple units, and those are ones that these two items have in common. Now the problem comes about when we want to try to learn something different about these two different parakeets here. We want to rapidly learn something about one that's not true of the other. And if memory is actually stored in the strengths of the connections between these units, if you're using the same units, you're going to overwrite the memory. It's called catastrophic interference. The idea is that inside the hippocampus, and in a structure called the dentate gyrus in particular, we do something called pattern separation. So we take these kinds of representations, like this Alexandrian and this Indian ringneck and this larch, and instead we turn it into something that is a typically thought of as a sparse code, so very few units on at a time, and also one in which they are not overlapping. And this is this pattern separation, separating the way we represent these. The idea being that if you do this and you reduce this overlap, you can have rapid learning without interference. And one of the ideas about the hippocampus in particular is that this may be sort of more universal or more domain agnostic sort of way, that it would separate along any dimension, because all sorts of portions, regions in the cortex do pattern separation. MT in visual cortex separates wonderfully in terms of the direction of motion, but only in terms of the direction and, well, velocity of motion. Whereas the idea is that the hippocampus will pattern separate perhaps along any kind of dimension. So how might we actually be able to observe this, though, in people? Because if my representations, if I do something like stick somebody inside of an fMRI scanner and I'm talking representations at the levels of neurons, my fMRI voxels will have thousands and thousands of neurons, and how can I possibly look at something at the level of a representation when my unit of recording is so coarse in terms of its resolution. Well, a technique that we leveraged off of to try to actually do this is to exploit repetition suppression. Very often it's the case, if I show you a picture like this telescope here in blue, and if I show it to you again, very often you'll see in fMRI uh, signals a reduction in the activity. Now, for our present purposes, it doesn't actually matter if it goes up or it goes down. All we need is that it actually changes with repetition. If instead, however, of showing an exact repetition, I showed something similar, like this uh, telescope here in green, we can see how does a particular region that responded to repetition respond to this similar lore. If it's a region that's doing, well, perhaps pattern completion or treating this as a repetition, it's going to treat it like a repetition and it will show activity that shows this same drop that a repetition would have showed. If, however, this region or this voxel is showing something consistent with pattern separation, well, it's going to treat it like a first presentation. Because to it, it isn't a repetition. It's not coming up with the same representation. It's coming up with a different representation, and a different representation is, well, what you'd have with a new item or a first presentation.
So this was one technique we used to indirectly get at pattern separation. We've done this a few times. On the top here we're showing uh, activity located to the CA3 and dentate subfields of the hippocampus. Can't really pull them apart for multiple reasons here. But the white, and uh, this is a zoomed in region looking at uh, the left and the right hippocampus here. And the different color codes look for subiculum in green and CA1 in blue and the CA3 dentate in red there. And according to computational models and studies from the rodent, we should see activity consistent with pattern separation in these CA3 and dentate regions. And by virtue of having the lower activity be very similar to the first presentation activity, that's consistent with this separation. We saw it in the left and the right CA3 dentate here. However, in the immediately downstream region of the hippocampus, another subfield called the CA1, the lower activity was much more like uh, repetition, showing just a slight increase, a slight trend toward looking more like a first presentation, overall looking much more like a repetition. We replicated this in a 2010 paper showing really the exact same pattern of activity here in the dentate CA3 and in the CA1. To have this really get at something like pattern separation, though, we want it to be, we want to really be able to come closer to observing this transformation. So we can think about functions like this, the change in input versus the change in output. If I have two similar pictures here, they would be on the left-hand side of this. No, not much change in the input. If I took two very different pictures, they'd have a big change in the input. Now, pattern separation is amplifying the dissimilarity. So anything in in yellow here, anything above this line is some form of pattern separation. Anything in blue is some form of completion, where you're increasing the similarity for it. So a big change in input would lead to a small change in the output. Well here what we have are some hypothetical curves where the CA1 may be tracking the exact change in the input, whereas the CA3 and the dentate gyrus, the CA3 has a very complex kind of relationship because of its anatomy, we think the dentate gyrus is very tuned toward pattern separation. But in my fMRI signals where I have to lump these, I may just be able to see a curve that looks like this. Some sort of curve that would represent the two of them. Well, in fact, in that study by Joyce Lacey, we actually had stimuli that we knew ahead of time had either no change in the input here, these repetitions, a small change in the input, for example, those umbrellas, larger change in the input, those movie reels, or two totally different pictures. And we were able to trace out and show that the CA1 is really tracking very cleanly this idea of the change in input. A nice, almost linear kind of change. Whereas as soon as you've made any real change here, even tiny changes like those two different umbrellas, we see that the dentate CA3 is treating it as if it's a new, uh, new stimulus here. Showing that this is very consistent with pattern separation. So it's one way we could get at pattern separation. Another way we could get at it is to use techniques described in the books, for example, that multivoxel pattern analysis that's described in your text. Here one might imagine this grid here being some grid worth of activity, some pattern across voxels here, and that in some similarity space here, these three different birds, the Alexandrian and the ringneck and the moustache parakeets, would all be very close to each other. They would be activating a similar pattern of activity that would be dissimilar from the pattern of activity associated with these uh, trees, which in turn would be similar to each other, and perhaps a different bird, this owl parakeet, would be closer to the parakeets, the Alexandrian Indian and ringneck, than it would be to the trees. So if you have a categorical representation, you are having these things be similar to each other. If they're similar to each other, they're not pattern separated. Something that would be more like a pattern separation would also sort of be something we call domain agnostic, in which there is no structure in all of this. So an alternate way one might be able to get at pattern separation and seeing whether regions are consistent with pattern separation or not is to see whether you can have activity that is more consistent with a category or more consistent with a sort of random kind of code. So in some work that we've recently done, we can also see this kind of thing, that structures in the parahippocampal cortex and in the perirhinal cortex those structures can actually classify whether you're looking at a face or an object. We can read out, based on the pattern of activity, which one you're looking at. We can also do it and read out in the parahippocampal and perirhinal cortex whether you're looking at faces or scenes and do that just fine. Whereas in the hippocampus, we can't read any of this out. It can't predict what you're looking at at all, which is consistent with this idea of pattern separation. I should note that the hippocampus can classify something, 
not that our data in there just can't classify anything. This versus a simple perceptual baseline, it's perfectly fine at actually doing. And finally, we might be able to get at pattern separation behaviorally. So here we had people look at a series of pictures, do an incidental encoding on them, are they indoor or outdoor, and later on they got a test in which they had to tell us, is it an old picture, like that four-leaf clover, which is an exact repetition? Is it a new picture, like that gravy boat, or is it similar but not exactly the same thing? Uh, the similar but not exactly the same thing lets us get at this idea of can they actually discriminate? Can they tell us that in fact it's something similar to what they've seen before, but not exactly the same? We can see if you damage the hippocampus, here this is a study done on a group of anoxic patients, they're perfectly fine at being able to tell us whether in fact exact repetitions are old, and whether novel foils are novel, that's the corrected recognition on the left, but with limited damage to the hippocampus they have a severe impairment in their ability to actually tell us that those similar items are in fact similar and not exactly the same thing. So take home message here from part one is that using things like high resolution fMRI we can see activity consistent with the dentate CA3, sorry activity consistent with pattern separation in the dentate CA3, it's in line with computational accounts and also parallels finding in the rodent. And we also have a behavioral task that lets us perhaps get at this. In part two, we'll get at this next question. Since aging affects the hippocampus, how does it also affect pattern separation?